This video is brought to you by Nebula. In a bombshell decision on Wednesday, Nicola Sturgeon announced her intention to resign as First Minister of Scotland. After coming to power in 2014 following Alex Salmond's resignation, following the Remain vote at the Scottish independence referendum, Sturgeon has led her country through some particularly difficult times. She presided over Scotland's COVID-19 response and the ongoing cost of living crisis, and has also navigated her country through the fallout from Brexit and the death of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. With Sturgeon only recently pushing through her gender recognition reform bill, it seemed fair to assume that she was planning on remaining in the role for a little while longer. So why did she resign? What's the plan now and who could replace her? We're going to split this video into three parts. First, we're going to look at her speech and her reasons for resigning. In the second section, we're going to look at some of the reaction to her resignation and where this leaves Scotland. And in the last section, we'll have a look at Sturgeon's potential successes. So let's start with the speech. Sturgeon started her speech a little after 11am on Wednesday to a group of journalists who were themselves presumably as surprised as everyone else. Prior to the announcement that there would be a press conference, there was no real indication anywhere that this was going to happen. Nonetheless, Sturgeon started by getting straight into it by explaining her reasoning behind stepping down. I have believed that part of serving well would be to know almost instinctively when the time is right to make way for someone else. And when that time came, to have the courage to do so, even if to many across the country and in my party, it might feel too soon. In my head and in my heart, I know that time is now. Sturgeon went on to try and reassure people that her decision had nothing to do with the current day-to-day -day politics of Scotland. This decision is not a reaction to short-term pressures. Of course, there are difficult issues confronting the government just now, but when is that ever not the case? This decision comes from a deeper and longer-term assessment. There are a couple of things that Sturgeon could have been referring to when she spoke of the difficult issues facing her government. She could be referring to her actions in the trans debate recently. Sturgeon has been a big advocate of trans rights during her time in office, but had agreed with a decision for a trans woman to be sent to a male prison after being convicted of rape. In subsequent interviews, she tried to square her decision with her allyship of the trans community to somewhat limited success. Trans women are, are women, but in the prison context, there is no automatic right for a trans woman. So there are contexts where a trans woman is not a woman? No, there is... <laughs> There is circumstances in which a trans woman uh, will be housed in the male prison estate. Is there any the context in which a woman born as a woman will be housed in the male estate? Look, we're talking here about trans women. And I'm now asking about women born as women. Uh, I don't think there are circumstances there, uh, but... So it's different for trans women? Well, yes, and I, I'm not... So they're not equal? Aside from this, she could have been referring to the ongoing case in which Sturgeon's husband is accused of providing a rule-breaking loan to the SNP. The chief executive of the SNP has said that the loan led to multiple compliance issues. It could even be simpler than this, though, with Sturgeon currently leading her party through a negotiation with the courts to try and acquire a de facto second referendum and with her trying to lead her country through the ongoing cost of living crisis. Sturgeon then went on and defended herself against these claims that she may be stepping down because the job got difficult. I have spent almost three decades in frontline politics, a decade and a half on the top or second top rung of government. When it comes to navigating choppy waters, resolving seemingly intractable issues, or soldiering on when walking away would be the simpler option, I have plenty of experience to draw on. So if this was just a question of my ability or my resilience to get through the latest period of pressure, I wouldn't be standing here today, but it's not. Anyway, getting back on to why Sturgeon stepped down, she explained that another reason that now is a good time to go is that largely people have already made their minds upon her. That the fixed opinions people increasingly have about me, as I say, some fear, others little more than caricature, are being used as barriers to reasoned debate in our country. Statements and decisions that should not be controversial at all quickly become so. Issues that are controversial end up almost irrationally so. 
Too often I see issues presented and as a result viewed, not on their own merits, but through the prism of what I think and what people think about me. So these are the main points from Sturgeon's speech. Let's move on to the second part of this video and discuss some of the reactions to her resignation. By all accounts, it seems that it's gone down quite well. Obviously, her opposite number in the Scottish Conservative Party, Douglas Ross, released a statement that was critical of Sturgeon. He said that he's glad that she has recognised that this is the right time to go. The leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Anna Sawa, has been a little less critical, saying that it's right that today we pay tribute to Sturgeon's achievements, particularly during the pandemic. Although he does end the statement by saying that Scotland needs new ideas and new passion to make our country the best place to grow up and grow old in. Interestingly, journalist Isabel Oakeshott, who is nominally right-wing and would usually have been critical of Sturgeon, actually tweeted that this is actually a masterful and surprisingly frank resignation statement by Nicola Sturgeon, who quits after acknowledging that she's become too divisive. Similarly, Robert Peston said of the speech, that was a truly remarkable statement by Nicola Sturgeon. Alistair Campbell similarly said, whatever your party or your stance on independence, her clarity and her commitment to public service are beyond doubt. So largely, the reaction has been broadly positive. To be fair, it's incredibly rare in British politics for leaders to leave office on their own terms. Usually, leaders are either ousted by their party for a mistake or a scandal, ousted by Parliament, or they simply lose an election. The fact that Sturgeon is leaving as and when she wishes will probably help her image when the history books are written. But while her role in frontline politics is soon to be over, we should turn our attention to what happens next in Scottish politics. The next step is for the SNP to decide on a timeline for Sturgeon's exit and for a leadership election. As per the mechanics of the leadership election, in order to be eligible, a candidate must obtain at least 100 nominations from party members from at least 20 of the local branches of the party. Then an election takes place in which all party members are eligible. Voting then takes place via postal ballots. This should all take place in the next few weeks. So moving on to the last part of this video, who could realistically stand? Well, there are a few big figures in the SNP. One obvious candidate is the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney. He's actually already been a leader in 2000 following the resignation of Alex Salmond, but left the role following disappointing election results. Due to his experience in these roles, he's seen by the party as a safe pair of hands. Another member of the old guard that has been speculated about today is Angus Robertson, who you may remember from his time as the SNP's Westminster spokesperson for 10 years, between 2007 and 2017. Moving to younger members, and we see that Kate Forbes is another potential candidate. She became Scottish Finance Secretary in 2020, following the surprise resignation of Derek Mackay. She's seen in the party as a rising star. Similarly, Husma Youssef is another younger candidate who's seen as potential leadership material. The 37-year-old has a lot of government departments under his belt, having been Transport Minister, a Europe Minister, Justice Secretary, and is currently serving as Scotland's Health Secretary. It's too early to speculate about which of these, if any, will succeed Sturgeon. But if you want to be kept up to date on all developments in UK politics, don't forget to subscribe. But if you want to look further afield than the UK, there are plenty of places all over the world that are underestimated and underdiscussed. some of which you've maybe never even heard of. So our friends over at Wendover Productions have a whole series where they dive into how and why some of the world's most remote settlements exist, from remote communities in the middle of Australia to why one of Italy's most visited places is dying. That series, Extremities, is exclusively available on Nebula, the streaming service that we're building with a bunch of our creator friends, many of whom you likely already know and love. And if you sign up to Nebula, you'll find all of our videos ad-free and occasionally before they're even released on YouTube. On top of that, you'll also find a whole bunch of TLDR explainers available exclusively on Nebula, plus an extended version of our show, The Daily Briefing, every single weekday. As I say though, there's more than just TLDR on Nebula. There's a whole bunch of other original series that we know you'll love, like Real Life Law's Incredible Modern Conflicts, which breaks down contemporary disputes around the world, Neo's Under Exposure, which runs through contentious and controversial topics you wish you'd always know more about, and of course, Extremities. All of these things are exclusively available on Nebula just like our extended daily briefings and a whole bunch of other exclusive TLDR content, which will never make it to YouTube. 
So if you want to sign up, the best way to do it is using our link in the description, which with our special discount, gets you the whole service for just a couple of pounds a month. A couple of pounds, which doesn't just go to some weird sponsor, but directly goes to educational creators like us. And that helps us out a whole lot, as does watching on Nebula more generally. So thanks for signing up, and we'll see you on Nebula.